There's a construction worker by the name of Patrick Lawler that thought he had himself a toothache. Anyone here ever have a toothache before? You know how it kind of runs everything? All you can think about, you can't get past that tooth. For almost a week, he tried painkillers. He tried ice packs to reduce the swelling that he was finding in his mouth. When nothing that he had discovered uh, brought relief, he finally went to the doctor. And uh, the dentist there took an x-ray, and it was only then that Patrick learned the true source of his toothache. It was only then that he was able to be given a remedy that would fix the problem. I mean, when the dentist reported their discovery to Patrick's wife, she thought they were joking. But this x-ray revealed the truth. There was a nail from a gun that had jammed a week ago, and when it backfired, it went up into Patrick's mouth, just missing his right eye. It had happened six days earlier when he was working with that nail gun. Now, even though he had a nail go into his mouth and up into his skull, he didn't know what was the problem. He just knew that he had himself one whale of a toothache. Yeah. He complained of the toothache. He complained of having blurry vision. Many remedies he tried uh, taking care of it himself. In fact, his wife writes that he even used ice cream to stop the swelling and make it feel better. Now, the doctors at the Denver hospital where it was successfully removed said that it took them four hours to remove it, and there was a neurosurgeon that had to be involved. And he said, and I quote, this is the second one we've seen in this hospital, where the person was injured by a nail gun and didn't actually realize that the nail had gone into their skull. Now, here's my point. A wrong diagnosis leads to a wrong remedy. Does that make sense? How many of you know he could have eaten Friendly's and Baskin Robbins out of ice cream and that pain wasn't going away? Amen? I've been complaining of a toothache for years now doesn't work because a wrong diagnosis leads to a wrong remedy. In the spiritual realm, as Christians, unless we recognize what the problem is, we'll apply the wrong remedy every time because the spiritual and the physical are very like and like, same and same. They're similar. Until we realize the deadly reality of what separates us from God, what do we call that? Sin, right? Until we realize it's deadly reality in our lives, we'll never really turn to the only solution. We'll never truly appreciate the passion of Christ. We'll never truly appreciate what he did until we realize what the malady is, what's wrong, okay, and how there is only one remedy. Now, I want us to think for a few moments today about balancing things out. About a couple weeks ago, I was passionately imploring you to consider the fact that there is nothing that you can do to earn your salvation, And uh, it has come to my attention that I was so passionate about making sure that you understood that, that maybe I needed to provide a little balance. And I'm going to do that this morning because this is so important for none of us to miss. All right? I'm going to start with 2 Corinthians 5.17 because I want to start with good news so we can end with good news. 
But 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, behold, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Now let's just think about that for a moment. If we're in Christ, that means if, if our life is centered in Christ, if we've given ourselves over to Christ, that means something has changed, amen? From before when we were not in Christ, something has had to have changed. We call that repentance, right? Where we, in sorrow, regrets, full, just full of all of that, we go to the Lord and we say, not my way anymore. I want to go your way. And we turn from our way and unto him. And he makes us a new creation. So that means that when I sin, I turn to Christ and I claim the forgiveness that I have in his blood. Amen? And what happens? He makes us a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Amen? Now, 1 Peter 1, 13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. For action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed in you. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, when you didn't know Christ. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy even as I am holy. Who wrote that? Our Lord. From the very beginning throughout the Old Testament, his prophets proclaimed, thus saith the Lord, be holy even as I am holy. Now we get to the days of Christ and the apostles and they're still saying the same thing. Be holy even as I am holy and whose I am, our God. Amen? Now, are you there yet? Hmm. Something we'd better be striving for, amen? That's why Paul said, not that I am yet perfect, but I strive towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We're striving. Psalm 29.2 kind of bastions this whole idea of being holy, all right? Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Have you experienced holiness this morning as we gather as God's people? I mean, holiness... I remember when I was a kid, it was such a strange word. And um, when I mention holiness to people who don't, they don't do the church, they don't know anything about the church, when I say, what is holiness, they kind of look at it because they associate it with something fanatical. You know? But what does holy even mean? And I know that some people, when you say holy, they immediately think of someone, okay? Um, could be Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, but they think of somebody that to them is holy, all right? Now, when I was young and as a teenager, if you asked me what is holiness, I would have said no drinking, no cussing, no gambling. I had this list of things that you don't do, and if you didn't do them, my teenage understanding said I'd be holy. You know? My mom kept saying, be in the word, it will wash you clean. Be in the word every day and you'll be fine. And I've said this so many times, and I'm going to say it again this morning. So many folks fall for what we call a legalistic or a rule-driven um, Christianity. And I want you to know, Jesus was all about a relational concept where you were in relationship with him and because you knew him and because you loved him, of course you were gonna obey him. Of course you were gonna teach other people about him. The greatest thing that we've ever known is Christ. Because of Christ, we have a future that goes beyond the grave, amen? All right, so when I was a kid though, I, I couldn't grasp all that. It was too much for my mind, or maybe I'm just too simple a guy, I don't know. But during my, uh, I don't know, probably 20s, I was 
looking at Christian literature that seemed to be filled with more rules than I could ever find in the Bible. How to Be the World's Best Christian was a book that somehow found its way into my mom and dad's house. Gave all the rules that you had to be or that you had to not be, that you had to do or not do in order to be a Christian. And um, it used that word legalism, and I just didn't get it. And I want to unpack that a little bit this morning. Because didn't King David dance before God when he was victorious in battle? 2 Samuel 6. And didn't Jesus turn water into wine at a wedding? So I was having problems saying no dancing because that was one of the things that I grew up with in the particular fellowship where I was at. There was no dancing allowed. And I couldn't figure that out because when I read the Bible, it seemed like God was honoring David's dancing, you know? And uh, it seemed like Jesus was turning the water into wine and I couldn't understand why would he do that if we're not to drink. You know what I'm saying? And because I was trying to sort out in my mind, what are the rules? What are the rules? And I want you to know as I've grown in Christ, my perspective has changed quite a bit. As a younger man, I felt relieved to learn that God didn't require a specific time for devotions. My mom and dad had simply said, you do them in the morning before you go to school. I thought that that was a rule somewhere. So people who did devotions at night, wow, were they going to be surprised when they didn't show up in heaven, you know? Because I was thinking of it like a kid, black and white. It was a rule. How easy it is for us to slide from the freedom that Jesus gives us. He says, if you're in Christ, then you are free Indeed, amen? Free to what? To not sin. Boy, it took me a while to wrap my head around that. Free to pursue Christ with total abandon. Free to, to love one another, even as he loved us. Amen? Is any of this clicking or am I? Okay, a couple of head nods. All right. In the middle of my newfound liberation, if you will, I um, had this unease that began gnawing away at the insides. Um, if holiness only meant keeping certain rules and now Jesus has made me free indeed and all the rules are gone, you know, um, what is holiness? What does he want from me when he says, be holy, even as I am holy. Did it, how, how could you be holy without being, obeying the rules? Does that make sense? And so I, was, I kept going from one extreme to the other extreme, trying to find the balance. And I asked my guy, I had a friend named John, I asked my buddy, what his, his thoughts on holiness were. And I remember John didn't, uh, he didn't have to think about it. It just immediately came right out of his mouth. He says, it attracts me like a magnet. What? Here I am struggling with holiness, and for you, holiness is, is attracting you to Christ like a magnet? This obviously it hadn't been my picture of the word, if you will. I asked him why, and he goes, because it's beautiful and it's balanced. And now he had me. I wanted to know. Where's this balance come from? He said, holiness shines in the darkness to remind us of how things should have been and what they will be like someday. Back to square one for me. Because if holiness was indeed beautiful, as Psalm 29 2 says, we just read it, rather than oppressive, the way I'd been starting to think, then I needed to ask God for fresh eyes 
to see holiness, for um, the ability to understand, to perceive it, to, to, to make it part of my life. 1 Peter 1.16 says it just as plain as can be, I am to be holy even as God is holy. So if holiness, if it relates to purity, what I've discovered is that it means to be set apart. Do you ever have anything that's set apart? Do you have like, um, for instance, when you receive a paycheck? As Christians, when we tithe, we set apart God's portion, right? That's what we do, and then that's what we bring up here at the 11 o'clock. That's what we put in the plate. That's something that's set apart. That is holy. See, because we set it apart and we said this is for God, for his work, for his kingdom. Does that make sense? Because it makes sense then that when we have our child um, baptized, we are setting them apart to be God's kid, God's boy, God's girl. Amen? I mean, we say we're, we, we vow that we're going to raise them within the church that they might know Christ we have made them holy because we've set them apart. He's starting to grab the essence of the word. It's how much of myself is set apart for God? Now, how many of you know the correct Christian answer? 100%, amen? So when I ask myself how much of me is set apart and I tell the truth, that's where that verse that we started with, it's not that I have yet attained perfection, but that I strive towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Because I want to give 100%. Holiness calls me to live by faith, not by sight, because God gives us principles rather than specific rules. Now, how many of you know the Ten Commandments are Ten Commandments? Amen? They're not ten suggestions. You with me? And we're free to obey all ten of them. Huh? Does that make sense? Because we're talking holiness. We are free to do that because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So it's not, you can never say, I followed all ten of the commandments and therefore I'm making it to heaven. But you can say, because Jesus Christ died for me. His blood cleanses me from all sin. And I've striven, or striven or strived? I strove. I did something to try to fulfill the Ten Commandments. Does that make sense? I feel like uh, Marco Ruby. I drinking water this morning. <laughs> These eternal principles that we apply to our lives look different in every situation. But I want you to know God's principles never change. He is unchanging from... Yesterday to today till tomorrow, he's unchanging. And I want you to know that one person might be a vegetarian or a vegan. The other one might eat meat, be a carnivore. And I want you to know both can be holy. Both can be God's kids. All right? Romans 14, 2 and 3. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Keep that in mind. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Hmm. To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So to live a holy life means I constantly go back to God for direction on how to live. I go back to his word for direction on how to live, and I find here that it doesn't matter if I do the vegan thing or the carnivore thing, both can be holy unto the Lord. How many of you know that there's times to stop being such a carnivore and be more of a vegetarian if you truly want to honor God? Kavish? 
That might be what God is individually calling one of us to do. But these are what, they, what Scripture has called disputable matters. He's saying keep the main thing, the main thing, the main thing. He says there's not a thing we can do to earn our salvation, but once we realize who Christ is and what he's done, and that he's done all the earning, we accept him and our life changes. If someone says they accept Christ and there is no change, I think they need to stop and ask again, Lord, there's no difference in my life. I want you to come in and tell me. I want you to speak to me. I want you to sense your presence. I want to know what it is I am to do because I want you to know the person unchanged. Jesus said that you're going to be known by your fruit. So if you're, you're living for yourself and then you say, okay, I want Jesus to come into my life and nothing changes, ask again. Ask yourself, have you really gotten into this thing that Jesus said to do? Because what did he tell us? His commission is very simple. Go and teach all the things that I have commanded you to other people. So if you don't know what all the things that he has commanded us is, guess what it's time to do? Go to school. Get out your Bible. Start to learn. And as you learn, I can promise you, you will change. When you belong to Christ, there's transformation that occurs. So, if you accepted Christ as an eighth grader and it's been 40 years now and nothing's changed, get into the Word of God. Get into the Word of God. Stop resting on a prayer that was prayed 40 years ago and rest on the prayer that is prayed today, on the time that is spent in God's Word today, the change that He wants to make in my life today. Because that is what being holy even as he is holy, is all about. I want, I want you to know, as a teenager, I grew up in a, a strange time um, in my parents' lives. And we had, I just finished my catechism in a very, um, what they call, high liturgical Lutheran church. You know, stone walls and silence. And... Um, if I recall, the pastor preached a lot longer than I ever have here at New Leaf, okay? But I was young, so it could have been short. I don't know, all right? But I can tell you this. There was a day when all of a sudden we were whisked away to a different church because after being in the church for years and years, my parents had discovered a relationship with Jesus Christ. I watched them change, I wasn't able to stay up with the change curve that they had. They were adults, you know? So I was left there wondering, wow, God is sure different at the new church, okay? Because it was a, it was a charismatic church. But the, um, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It, just, it was different than the Lutheran church that I grew up in, okay? And um, then all of a sudden... Um, some things happened, especially monetarily. There was an energy crisis, they told us. I was still a kid. And all of a sudden, gas shot up to, I think, a dollar a gallon. And um, we couldn't afford to go the 25 miles to church and back. And, and so we started going to a UCC church that was right up the hill, okay? And God was remarkably different there, too, from a kid's perspective, all right? I just want you to know that, there, I mean, for instance, I wasn't allowed to attend movies and theaters, okay? Because whatsoever things are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, you think on these things, and there were things in the movies that wouldn't lead me towards any one of those things. So my mom and dad kept me away from that. That was their choice on how to raise me to be holy, even as God is holy, but I want you to know I didn't get it as a kid. I get it now. But as a kid, I was having a hard time wrapping my mind around it because I was constantly going towards the legalistic, the rules, and I was missing the relationship. I knew a lot of the do's and don'ts. But I'd never had that moment that Wesley called when his heart was strangely warmed 
when he had a sense of the Holy Spirit being alive and active in his life. So I just want you to know that I'm not proclaiming that holiness is easy, but I don't know a thing in life that's worth doing that doesn't require some effort. And so what began as an attempt for me to sort out what the rules were, in that I discovered a relationship where the rules are still valued because it's true. God doesn't want us to have anyone else before him. And I could go through each one of the Ten Commandments They're so true today. I can go through all the different things where scripture tells us, exhorts us through both edict and principle, okay? Good principles like uh, go to the ant, you sluggard. What's, What's that all about in Proverbs? And the next line says you need to save. Now, how many of you know that's a good principle? You need to save because there does come rainy days, amen? The church needs to save. God's people need to save. There are great, awesome, God-delivered, God-given principles and rules in Scripture that really help us to be holy even as he is holy. You can't throw them out in an effort to enjoy your liberality, the liberation, the freedom that you have in Christ. Instead, those rules now guide you toward a better relationship. Is this making sense? Hmm. I just heard my wife go, hmm. (laughs) Let me try this. God, to this day, shows me, he exposes in my life areas where I need to repent. Okay? Okay? Now, the day that I received Christ, May 18th, 1991, I was was kneeling next to this woman at our um, wedding. And I was supposed to be praying a prayer for our marriage, and instead, I was doing what I'd made a deal with the pastor on. I told him I'd give my life to Christ at the wedding. I didn't tell her that. But... um, I'd made a decision that I was going to give my life to Jesus. And I can't tell you for how many, that, what time that was. It had to have been at least the 358th time, okay? But there was a difference. And the difference was, this man had, this pastor had explained to me that when I did it this time, as I got up from the rail, I needed to pursue everything that I knew I was to do and to abstain from everything that I knew I was to not do that I might have a relationship with Jesus Christ that was real and vibrant. And you know what? I gave it a shot. And my life changed. Not overnight, not overnight. But I, I'm telling you, it changed and it was noticeable. She eventually caught up with what was, when it, when it had gone down. She figured it out. Four years later. <laughs> I'm slow. But I want you to know there's beauty in holiness. There's freedom in holiness. It's the beauty of seeing God's kingdom grow, of knowing that there's one more person who's not going to know the horrors of hell because you shared Christ with them. And as they watch you and your witness that because of these Beautiful principles, these things that are given as commands in Scripture, as I align my life with those, I know that my witness now shines for Christ, and we reflect his glory. And yes, there's times we fall, and he picks us up, and we pick one another up, amen? But that's why it's about not not that I've achieved perfection, but that I'm striving toward it. And in that process, living a holy life makes us the light that shines in the darkness. 
the salt that preserves the good. Remember, Jesus told us to be salt, to be light. So holiness is important. It is relevant. It is perhaps the missing ingredient in many churches, in many branches of the Father's vine, where they see no growth, it's because there's not people that are pursuing holiness. And so my experience at conversion was that the practice of holy living results in true relationship. The way I live my life, the way I submit, the way I surrender to Christ in every moment has everything to do with whether I'm pursuing holiness or not. And so I want to leave you with these brief phrases. They're on the screen. I want you to think about each one. Here's the first one. Watch your thoughts because they become your words. Do you know that? Things you think about, the fullness, out of the fullness of your heart, the fullness of the essence of who you are, the mouth speaks. So watch your thoughts. They become your words. Here's the second one. Watch your words. They become your actions. You talk about it a lot, you're going to start acting that way. Watch your actions because they become your habits. Gabish? Yeah. And watch your habits because they become your character. One more. Watch your character. It becomes your destiny, your destination. Would you pray with me? Praise team, come back. Lord, um, this doesn't preach easy and it doesn't live easy and we need your help, Father. We need to find that balance. Lord, help us to honor the rules, the commands that you have given us, the principles that you've imparted to us through your word. But Lord... Help us to be pursuing a relationship with you the whole while. For Lord, we understand now it's out of that relationship that you produce obedience, that you produce surrender in our lives, that we might be holy even as you are holy. Father, if I've messed this one up, sorted out through the power of your Holy Spirit in each person's life here, that we might truly know and understand and pursue you with every bit of who we are. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.